male da mare che non è mare Dear Cola, my mother is always trying to convince me that I'm beautiful, that being black is beautiful. But if that's true, how come all the boys at my school only want to dance with white or Mexican girls at the school dances? How come everyone makes jokes about my natural hair? They don't react to my brown skin like it's beautiful. They call us ghetto for having dark skin. Black boys sit with the white girls on the bleachers at lunch and clown us brown girls. Even the darkest black boys who came from black mothers <sighs> clown brown girls like we are a disease. They only carry the books for white or Mexican girls or a high yellow girl with long, long hair. They hate us black girls. None of the black girls have boyfriends. None of the black girls have a boyfriend who will be open about it in front of others at my school. Many of the black girls at my school are down low. We play a game called boyfriend and girlfriend with other black girls or with the fat white and fat Mexican girls nobody wants either. We aren't lesbians, but we play that game so we can experience romantic feelings of being in love and having a boyfriend. I never met my father. Sometimes I wish I had a father. But then I am scared to think what he would be like. I study a lot of grown black men wondering which one could be my father, but they all seem angry and bitter. They hate me for being a black girl. They hate me for being a black girl too, but they want to take me to a motel on the way to school. I hate being a black girl, Cola. No one loves us. We are not beautiful, no matter what you and my mother say. When it comes to the subject of beauty, I feel such a heavy heart. I remember this year, Boss Up Magazine put me on the cover as the ugliest woman in the world. Um, I remember Wale, the rapper, did a song 
um, in which he called me um, ugly. Um, I remember, uh, and that's because I called him out about colorism and his, you know, at that time, his failure to use, he, he's black, he's Nigerian from Africa, and he made a video called Beautiful Girls, and not one of the women in the video was black or looked anything like his mother. Um, people claim that there's some black women in the video, but they don't look black. I remember Miss Gia, J-I-A, Miss Gia, the blogger online, who I thought was my friend, and I remember how devastated I was when someone made a joke calling me a beast. And, you know, they were saying that I was ugly and this and that, and she retweeted it and laughed about it. And I remember crying at my computer, you know, just the cruelty of people telling me that I'm ugly and um, if you follow me on Twitter if you've been online with me then you know that people constantly say how ugly Cola Booth is um, there's some kind of ugly joke made about me all the time because of the issues I raise and because I'm about serious things in the community not you know the things that most you know people want to talk about or most men want to talk about It's really hard when you feel ugly. And that's what we're going to deal with head on today. The candy man makes everything he makes satisfying and delicious. Today, I really want to talk in depth about beauty. It's the number one thing that women are judged by, what we look like, whether we're too fat, too skinny, you know, there's always some kind of judgment being made based upon what we look like and not who we are or what our talents are. When I was a little girl, um, something happened to me that changed my life and allowed me to know and to always believe that I was beautiful. And that something was that by accident I watched the Barbara Walters special and her guest was a very unique looking Jewish superstar named Barbara Streisand. Barbara Streisand, who has got to be one of the greatest women in world in human history. I mean, I am such a fan of her life and her struggle and everything that she has done with herself and for other women. She's done so much for us. Yentl is one of my top favorite films of all time because of the strong feminist message and um, the message about women's worth. But what I saw on the Barbara Walters special was Barbara Streisand explaining that when she first came to Hollywood, they thought she looked and sounded too Jewish. And so they wanted to cut off her nose. They wanted to change her last name from Streisand to Sands, S-A-N-D-S, you know, to make her less ethnic, to hide the fact that she was Jewish. She was one of the first superstars, and you really have to give Barbara Streisand credit about this. She was one of the first stars to refuse to hide her Jewish name. Um, as far as looks go, I don't think she could have hidden her Jewish look. But to me, as a little kid, I remember thinking, what a uniquely beautiful looking woman. <laughs> Everyone always jokes and says that she's ugly. Um, you know, I... I think we've all heard people call Barbara Streisand ugly. To me, Barbara Streisand was just one of the most beautiful women when I was growing up. I used to watch Funny Girl, What's Up Doc, The Way We Were, um, all these wonderful films and then TV specials and, and everything about her. I just thought because she looked so different, because she was so unique 
and had so much incredible talent and brilliance, just genius intelligence. She was just one of my childhood idols as far as beauty went, <laughs> along with Diana Ross, um, Lola Falana, Cicely Tyson, Vanetta McGee, um, Lynette McKee from Sparkle, who I just idolized. Um, there were so many beautiful women, Jane Kennedy, Diane Carroll, but I put Barbara Streisand right in that group list and Toni Morrison and Alice Walker. Toni Morrison and Alice Walker were beauty Im images, beauty symbols to me when I was a kid as well. Um, you know, beauty is subjective as people like to say, but in my honest opinion, and this is really how I see the world and how I look at things, I don't feel that anyone is really ugly. You know, it takes a person to really be seriously damaged for me to think of someone as ugly. Um, I can see beauty in people because I usually am not really looking so much at what they look like. But the energy that I feel from them, what I get from them, what I see from them, that energy pretty much, you know, <laughs> decides for me what someone looks like. Now, the heroic thing about Barbara Streisand, as she said on the Barbara Walters special, she was determined to be herself, and she felt that if she let them remove her nose, if she let them change her name, then she would no longer be herself. She would no longer be beautiful. And um, that was the most important thing to her. <laughs> We all suffer from self-hatred. I suffer from self-hatred. As much as I preach to you and to younger people about the importance of loving yourself and being who you are and, you know, even I, as much as I know intellectually that we are supposed to love ourselves and, and want to, you know, be in our own image, look at the fake hair that I wear. I'm doing this to show you that even Cola Booth is affected by this culture and this white supremacist Eurocentric society. I'm doing it to show you that I am just like you. Just because I talk out about those issues, just because I constantly um, make a big stink about it and write about it and talk about it and pressure people about it and you know criticize people for it doesn't mean that um, what you should know is that the people that are the biggest activists they're activists because they have experienced self-hatred they know something's wrong and they're trying to change the world for all of us so it's hard you know I go through being told that I'm ugly you know you look like a man um, that's the favorite thing they like to say to black women who think have you know an attitude or have some and you know I'd be naked without an attitude but anytime that a black woman has an opinion and she's free and she um, is a critical thinker then they call you a lesbian you're a lesbian you're really a man you hate men all of that camel shit you know is put against you and so um I don't like being judged that way and it's real pressure for women to constantly be judged on what we look like and then if we don't meet the standards of what we're supposed to look like, we are made into pariahs. We are pushed out of certain activities that we totally do belong in. Let me tell you, the best person in bed the woman who men really want to fuck and don't know it, it's usually that woman they consider ugly, fat, whatever. That's usually the hottest chick if you really want to know what hot is. But no, we're so, in this society, we are just so, um, God, how can I put it? We are so um, shallow. And really, more than shallow, we're stupid. You know, the things that we believe about other people, the, the way that we're willing to look at other people based on bullshit, it's just no good. 
it's no good at all. And so I'm encouraging you to look in the mirror and envision what you want to see yourself as and reinvent yourself. Do what you want to do to create yourself. But understand that you're already perfect. Understand that just like race is a social construct, so is beauty. Beauty is a social construct made up by a very few people. In this day and age, they are a few white people in a room somewhere, in a skyscraper in New York somewhere, deciding what is beautiful. And that is completely fraudulent and bogus of them. You know, that is not how beauty should be determined. Beauty is a social construct, though, and you need to really understand that. That it's not real. That you are perfect. That you are the image of what you are supposed to be. And that you should be loved. Even if you aren't, I want you to know and really believe in your heart and yourself that you should be loved. Know that you should be loved and you should be accepted as yourself and you should be seen as beautiful by others. If I was to see you, I would see your beauty. You know, the minute you smile or the minute that you speak to me, I would see your beauty shining through. I really, really believe that life is about loving and healing each other. Um, I started my own religion. It's called The Womb. W-O-M-B. The Womb. Just because of stuff like beauty and, and colorism and sexism and, you know, I just want so much to remove my life from the power of the society and from the power of men and from the power of people who just really don't give a fuck about us. People who, corporations that make money off us and use us. And it's been hard. I mean, as you can see by this wig on my head, I am not perfect and I have not fully succeeded. You know, I still go by the same insecurities and the same things that you do. I still suffer terribly. But um, I really, really do know better, even if I'm not able yet to do better. I do know better. I do know that beauty is when you look like your own people, you know? And um, don't listen to people that say horrible things about you, that put you down. Often those same people are jealous of you for some reason. You have a lot of people who will throw all kinds of things in your face um, because they're insecure about their own selves. They are lacking in their own selves. And so they want to tear down others because they frankly aren't worth a shit. They aren't beautiful. And so they want everybody else to feel the same way. Don't buy into it. It's so hard to go to school or be at a party and to be told that you're just not pretty, you're not attractive, you know, you're ugly, you, you know, and we all go through this, but especially I have experienced being dark skinned and a woman, you know, dark skinned female. And so that has been exceptionally hard as far as people being brutally cold and uncaring and vicious in the way that they talk about us and, and dehumanize us and put us down it really really hurts a lot it really hurts and it affects your life and it's hard to believe in yourself it's hard to express your talent it's hard to be what you want to be when you are constantly made fun of told that you're ugly and worst of all once you believe it once you believe what the people are saying about you to hurt you um after that, it's so hard to achieve in life, to be what you were meant to be, to rise above to where you were meant to rise. You know, it's very difficult to do that once you have been subjected to people's hatred so deeply. 
in my book, The Sexy Part of the Bible, in my book, The Sexy Part of the Bible, I wrote a line that I think really sums up this whole thing about beauty for me. And that line is, beauty is when you look like your own people. Beauty is when you look like your own people. Men are not looking for love. A lot of men are looking for sex. A lot of men are insecure and they're looking to sex as many women as possible to make them feel more like they're the big guy, the important guy. Um, a lot of men um, are very nice men who just want to have sex, who just don't want to be married. And in order to get that pussy, they've got to, you know, play a game and tell you what you want to hear and so it's very hard in this life for a woman we are socialized that we have to love a man that we have to be um, chaste and virginal and and not a whore and all of the you know all of that stuff is bullshit to me because to me a woman is a human being and a woman owns her own sexuality and whatever she wants to do with her life sexually is her business. It's up to her. She just should be smart about it, clean about it. But at the same time, I feel that a woman's sex life, her sexual power, that's her own domain. But the thing is, is that still the pressure is on us. And so many of us don't have the courage of you know, a lot of you didn't come from the background Cola Booth came from, where I witnessed my parents murdered in front of me. It made me kind of fearless, and it changed me forever to where I'm a certain way. You know, no one can really control me or make me think a certain way, but so many women are not like that. You want to please your parents. You want to please your father. You want to please the men of your community. You care what men say and think. <laughs> And so for women like that, the pressure is really, really tough. You often find yourself 60, 70 years old and find out that you missed out on life. You didn't get to experience things that were fantasies of yours, things that you wanted to do because you were told that, you know, it's forbidden or it will make you a bad person. Um, you know, it's not something that you should do and, you know, all that kind of stuff. The whole slut shaming, as they call it. Um, so many women miss out on life and miss out on all the good sucking and fucking and fun of their youth because, you know, they bought into the whole religious mantra and the whole man-made mantra of the word lady. Because you have to remember, the word lady is a man-made word that actually means a set of behaviors that men have approved. Alice Walker said she never wants to be called a lady and that she's not a lady. And I feel the same way. I'm not a lady and I don't want to be called a lady either. I'm a woman. I'm a woman. And as a woman, I have my states of being that change from time to time. Somebody who was a whore two years ago might be a happily married woman right now or who was married back in the day might be a whore right now women our lives are transitory we change with the times depending on our own biological clock and depending on our own mental faculties and what our tastes and desires are we change that is what a woman is she's constantly in progress um, I have a saying, you know, she's like the ocean becoming more and more of herself. And so, um, and that's from one of my books. So if you steal it, just know it's in my books. But um, I was blessed to be in a black American home where we had a wonderful father and a very strong black American mother. My black American mother used to sing this special song to me and my two sisters anytime that we felt ugly 
or people at school made fun of us, she would sing this song. The candy man makes everything he makes satisfying and delicious. I'm not in the best voice right now, but my black American father used to call us his princesses. He, um, people don't realize that my strength and everything comes from my two fathers. My birth father, my Arab Egyptian Muslim birth father, Harith bin Farouk, and then my black American father, um, Marvin Johnson, from the day I arrived in America, called me his little African princess, um, doted on me, was always there for me, was always there for my sisters, was vehemently insistent that you know we had to um, that we were beautiful now he wasn't perfect because you know a lot of being beautiful and being told you're beautiful and being expected to be beautiful is patriarchy a lot of it's you know not good for us but still he did the best he could um, you know we couldn't wear pants that's the kind of father that my father was. He was just very, very um, loving, but at the same time, well, let me just tell you, when he died, and there's eight children, there's five boys and three girls, four of us are adopted. When my father died, he told me on his deathbed that I was, that he was proud of me and loved me so much because I was the son that the boys never turned out to be as far as the things that my father believed in, which was black beauty, was at the top. My father, terribly uh, Afrocentric, believing in black beauty, loved my black mother. He's the one, which is what people don't understand, told me that if these, my father would say these niggas, if they don't know how to act, if they don't know how to appreciate you, if they're not giving you what you deserve and, and the attention that you need and deserve and, and loving you as a black woman, cherishing you. It was my Afrocentric, very, very strong father who said, go elsewhere. You know, don't wait on these, you know, and he would always call them niggas, of course. My black American mother is the one who made up the term nigger stock. She was also very black, black as far as her mentality, but she was different from my father in that she, and my mother is still alive, and she lives with me, and she's just the best mother ever. But my mother, her thing was, my mother had been a school teacher when she did work. A lot of times she didn't work and just took care of us children. But my mother had um, believed that sugar rather than vinegar is what attracts everything and to always be sweet and to be quiet and my mother believed that you know it was important for us to know that we're black and beautiful and all those things but at the same time she was much less on it than my father was she was um you know there's a thing audrey lord told us that our silence will not save us and I firmly believe that. And my mother was one of those black women who believed all the right things, but was often um, more silent than my father. More, um, you know, well, that's the way the society is kind of feeling than my father. Um, but she's still the best mother that any child could have. Our book of the day is actually going to be a book by me. I want so desperately for black American women, black American women and Jamaican women and Haitian women and African women, Sudan, South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, Mozambique, Tanzania. I want black women in Germany. I want black women in Japan. I want you to really understand where you come from. And that is why 
I am asking you to read the book, The Sexy Part of the Bible, which is written by me. It's a very acclaimed book. It has nothing to do with the Bible. The book is about an African woman who travels the different continents of the world. And by reading her story, I don't want to give away stuff. You know, it's a very, very acclaimed book and it's much loved. When you read it, you'll really understand why. It's an easy book. It's fast to read. It's only 223 pages, but it will change your life. Um, I love black women so much. I love these little black girls so much who write to me and are counting on me to do something. You know, they're counting on us. Like Audre Lorde said, our silence will not save us. And our little black daughters, granddaughters, nieces, little black girls everywhere are counting on us to raise hell in this society, to make it possible that one day they don't have to wear this wig I have on. They don't have to feel like that to be beautiful. They have to wear this wig. They don't have to feel like to be beautiful that they have to look more European and less African. It affects us all. I have never been in denial about it and I've always been an outspoken speaker on it. And so that is why I want you to really, really put whatever you think of me aside. And please read this book, The Sexy Part of the Bible, because the truth is Beauty is when you look like your own people. And there's a context, a subtext that you have to get in your mind to understand what you are supposed to look like. What each and every individual one of you, whether you are white as milk, claiming to be black, or black as charcoal, like my birth mother was, Whatever color, chocolate, fudge, cocoa, cinnamon, nutmeg, toast, whatever. It's so important, black women, for you to understand where you come from. Not back in the slave plantation a few hundred years ago. 400 years as a baby. Black Americans are a baby. My country, Sudan, we're 26,000 years old, at least tribally. It goes older than that, but I'm saying our clan, I am from the Ormo tribe, Jidwak clan. I'm half Arab, so I have to also give credit to the Sunni Muslim Arab side. My father has Turkish blood. My Arab father, who was a white Arab, had Turkish blood, so I have Turkish blood in me. I have Falasha blood in me. But all these tribes and clans that I'm naming that are in me are over 26,000 years old. Black Americans need to plug in to the message I'm bringing. Fuck whether you like cola or not. Just read the damn books so you can get the information that the universe has sent me to bring you. Get over it. Whatever it is you have against me or, oh, I don't really like African women. I don't like... Jamaican women, you know, all that bullshit that black women have. Get over it. Read the messages being brought to you. I am risking my life being hated, constantly hated on, to bring you the true black woman's beginning and her message in my books. So please, Read for yourself the sexy part of the Bible. Read my autobiography, Diary of a Lost Girl. Read these books so that your daughters can stop thinking that there's something wrong with them. So that you can plug into the information that you need to give your children. So that you can teach your sons why they need to value black women and black babies. And not just so you can do that, but how to do it. How to do it without black children rebelling against the message. And I need to do a whole episode on just that, how to do it. 
when I was um, a young woman and my husband and I, my black husband, this is my first husband, my black husband, got together and had our children from birth. We taught our sons that their skin is the same color of the soil of the earth. We constantly, when they would take a bath, I would stop in the middle of the bath and say, oh my God, your brown, brown arm, oh, this brown chocolate skin, you know, this is what makes the earth. This is what creates, you know, and in my culture, men are trees and the woman is the earth. And from the earth comes the trees. Um, my husband is the same way, my black husband. He loved black women and always, to, to this day, because my boys are raised by him just as much as, as they are by me, if not more, he teaches our son the value of black women. All my husband's women since he met me have been black. Now he was dating a Latina and a white woman at the same time when he first met me and I took him from those women. And we were married for 10 years. But ever since he met me, he's only been with black women. His woman he has now is darker than me and she's from Jamaica. She's 15 years younger. But we teach our sons actively, psychologically, without telling them directly. We psychologically, psychologically have trained our sons to value blackness. Not to be against any other race, not to be against white women or white people or whatever, but we have psychologically taught our sons the way that white children are taught by their white parents because it's subliminally. It's not usually on purpose the subliminal message constantly is that this is what is the norm. This is what is beautiful. This is blah. And so our children, for instance, aren't allowed to watch television. Our sons aren't allowed to, you know, do all that kind of stuff. All the images that they get come from us. We make videotapes of what they can watch. We constantly make remarks that are psychological since they were born about what is beautiful, what is valuable, so that in their head they were they received a certain message. They were never called, you nappy headed, dumbass, you know, you would never see my sons being come here, bring your little nappy headed black ass self here. Ever. That kind of language they never experienced. Everything about them was black is beautiful, um, you know, blah -de -da, -de da But you need to read my books where you can really get it more without dealing with me, you know, without dealing with cola and whatever it is that you don't like about cola or, you know, whatever it is about me. Read the books because what I have put is so integral, so important, and so real. And it's what you need. It's the nourishment and the information, the, 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 the knowledge that you need. So our book of today, our book for the day, um, is written by me this time, and it's called The Sexy Part of the Bible by Cola Booth. Get that book and read that if you feel you're ugly. If you're a black woman and you feel that you're ugly and you're unattractive and, you know, whatever, or you don't understand sex or how to be sexy or why it's okay to be sexy or if you just have a problem breaking through the lies, the myriad lies that this society imposes on black women about who we are and what we are and what we're supposed to be, the stereotypes. If you want to understand who we are who and what your real roots are, who your real mother is, how your real journey began, The Sexy Part of the Bible by Cola Booth. Read that book, sister. We are beautiful. Well, as always, I end with a line that I made famous from one of my old Arabic films. Me love you long time.
This is Search for Tomorrow. This portion brought to you by Extra Fresh Liquid Trail. The freshness they'll notice today and tomorrow.